Right, so Juan, we've been talking about a few industry-specific issues lately in all our episodes. I wanted to touch base with you today on flash crashes, given the the world is going through an interesting time at the moment with the coronavirus, today being the 27th of March, 2020. Um, I'd like you to speak to what flash crashes are very very briefly and how they come about. What, what generates these sorts of swan-like event, events? Right. Um, I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm like the world's number one expert in flash crashes, but um, I think there, if you had to generalize, you basically need some sort of background situation to get to a point where two things happen at the same time, where that's a peak demand event, which meets a situation of thin liquidity for whatever reason that might be. So this thin liquidity might be because there's just no real interest in in meeting that surge in demand or because there's been some technical issue that has somehow meant that for a while there was no liquidity and, and things sort of in, in some way what, what happens is you get some avalanche where there's a fundamental mismatch between supply and demand and this creates a large shock to prices no, so i, I guess the okay so the, the, the first thing is, is really a, a, the, the, what triggers a flash crash is always a drastic price movement. That's okay. And for like, I'm, I'm sure clients, especially now in, in this environment at the moment, are probably interested in, you know, knowing how this impacts them as, as clients of the brokerage arm. So, so what, what would we want to say to them? In, in such yeah, no, so we're, we're not done with how it happens. It's, it's really so like the first thing mm -hmm. at the beginning of a flash crash, there's always some sort of trigger element. Okay. You think of, a, I mean, I think the best visual I can think of in terms of uh, finding a, a, like an analogy is really an avalanche. Okay. So for you to get an avalanche, there's something that gives and creates a sudden kind of uh, seismic or some, yeah. Yeah, sudden movement right. uh, in, in and, and the thing starts moving. And then the question what determines if that original trigger then goes on to become a flash crash and a self compounding like snowball, mm -hmm. the, the snowballing effect that we need is that this mutual reinforcing uh, dynamics that, that build up the momentum. And, and typically what that is, is uh, stop orders. So, uh, um, so there's this large movement in the price, which triggers a stop loss by people who wouldn't otherwise have traded mm -hmm. and compounds the situation of peak demand versus thin liquidity because it, it actually becomes a mutually reinforcing uh, phenomenon. Okay. And uh, as that happens, then, you know, at some point, if there is just no, I mean, you get to a point of, uh, what do you call it? The elasticity of price demand, mm -hmm, which just mm -hmm, becomes yeah. infinite and, you know, you can raise or, or lower the price as much as you want. There's still no one who's offered uh, interesting and offering supply to meet that peak demand. And therefore the, the price movements become ever bigger which compounds the effect of more and more people trying to get out of that trade, which compounds the price movement mm -hmm. and so on and so it's forth. It's why that until... effect is so exaggerated for that reason. Yeah, and that, that's when all hell breaks loose. <laughs> that's, that's <basically. laughs> to put it mildly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's when, you know, when the when the stuff hits the, the fan. Uh, and um, yeah, and then of course it depends on, on, on what, I mean, of course there are contagion effects. So, mm. you know, when people try to get out of, uh, you know, Swiss rank position, then for whatever reason, once the Swiss rank is also there's inter interconnectedness, which then, you know, the, the whole thing it's it's compounds as a domino effect. I guess that's the that, that's the important point to to be to be making. Okay. And it's actually quite a dangerous thing to have, of course. Yeah. Uh, especially if there's leverage. Right. So, yeah. So and and the other thing, of course, is the probability of people of uh, stop losses triggering. Uh, is exacerbated by the leverage in the system, right? Because if you don't have leverage mm -hmm. in the system, that you don't really, you know, you don't have that tight stops, mm -hmm. and uh, and and you don't send more volume and so on and so forth. So you need this kind of breeding ground for bad stuff to happen, yeah. and then all it takes, it's a bit like World War One, right? You yeah, know, it wasn't yeah. killing the emperor that triggered World War One. Is that you had a lot of, you know, lots of awful stuff going on, and mm -hmm. then boom, it, uh, that was like the tipping point. Um, right. And so that's the one. We've, we've had a couple of these, uh, and, you, and it really depends on, on the venue where it is. This is why it's so important to try and not fragment liquidity, because mm -hmm. to the extent that you have uh, supply and demand coexist in different venues with imperfect transmission of information and or volumes across venues, that's what makes 
the system more vulnerable than I guess the, the, the system is, that is only as strong as the weakest link in there. Mm -hmm. And this comes back to the discussions we've had about over-the-counter um, bilateral clearing versus uh, a central counterparty, because uh, the central counterparty in this case, because it pools all the demand and the supply under one roof, it makes the uh, the convergence of information faster and, and, and makes the uh the, the process of, of price discovery much more much more efficient so on that again, note so actually that's, that's a good point uh, on that note could you shed some more light on what you mean by fragmenting liquidity I and mean, you said earlier that it's important not to fragment liquidity for for our clients for instance like what should they infer from that yeah so for instance um in the last couple of weeks there's been so robin hood which was the like the the darling of vc world that had grown very very quickly into being a very significant broker in the US with their uh, no commission brokerage mm -hmm. um, they've had a, and I don't know I think it's two to three outages in the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. um, uh, potentially and I obviously I'm not privy to the inside the details of this no. but um, I, I know they that one of the core elements of the value proposition is that they don't route volumes or at least not 100% of volumes to traditional venues mm -hmm. because if they routed those to the exchanges the exchanges charge them a commission so mm -hmm. if they don't charge a commission to the customer then you know then there goes mm -hmm. the business model yeah. so um what they do is they sell the order flow to high frequency traders mm -hmm. and these high frequency traders what uh, they, they they are typically is this information uh, in the public uh, domain this uh, what the robin hood they selling uh, no, the, the, robin... the selling in flow to HFT. yes yes this is you know this, oh. this is i mean i've and it, like, if, if if it wasn't, I wouldn't know because I'm not privy to any insider oh, wow. information about that. Uh, wow, that's Robin pretty Hood. pretty big. Okay. Uh, and then no, it's even. I mean, I think if anybody likes this this topic, they can read uh, last year's Interactive Brokers um, annual report. It has a full page letter by the founder of Interactive Brokers explaining the dangers of this commission free uh, trading. Yes. Which, because the fact of what what this flow is doing is bypassing traditional exchanges and the fact of free riding from the price discovery process. So you, you basically they rely that there's always an exchange that has a valid price, and what they do is arbitrage between the price they they offer mm -hmm. um, the, the 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 Robinhood clients and the best price that can that's available from multiple exchanges. Because that in itself is another issue, right? You have yeah, multiple yeah, venues yeah, yeah. where if you have instead of having all of the demand and supply for say the Apple stock converge on a single order book, but instead you have four order books, then already you can have high frequency a high frequency trade to be carried out, which is to basically match the best spread in either of the four and offer that to the trader and pocket the difference between that and somebody else who's buying on exchange. So that's kind of the arbitrage trade that they do. And then the next uh, iteration on that is to actually bypass the exchange altogether because uh, you just found a third party, which is in this case, the Robin Hood customer base, mm -hmm. who who doesn't, you know, whose flow never goes to the exchange. So in that case, the, the Fragmentation is, you know, is happening. The price discovery process is a lot less robust because not all the flow is is informing the price. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's just a, a proxy for that, yeah. which is a bit the same thing as with the CFDs. In, in some ways, CFDs are sort of moving closer to the exchanges, but then exchanges are moving closer to the CFDs, yeah. uh, <laughs> and, and, it, and it's all a bad thing. And uh, this is the sort of breeding ground that makes um, uh, a flash crash more difficult. I mean, at this this week we're talking about. This is the week of uh, March 27th, mm -hmm. and this is kind of right in the middle of the, in the thick of the COVID thing. Yeah. And it has been a really difficult week for um, uh, gold, uh, yes, you know, gold trading. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen is unseen levels of divergence in the in between the prices of the CFDs, mm -hmm. the, the CFD market, and in the in the underlying futures market. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's that's something that's ongoing. Uh, and and it just uh, you know it basically says that the system obviously there's been an external shock which is the COVID but yeah. the system has been eroded from within for quite some time by a number of bad policy decisions in my opinion. And the but, stimulus um, by, is only just bringing this to the surface now. Yes, yes, it's basically that's when the, the crap was done before, but mm. now this is just a surface. It's it's not COVID's fault. COVID is just a mess. COVID just exposed it a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So, so essentially, for for people who do come across messaging from other entities uh, that really pushes this no commission trading uh, bollocks, to be honest. Yeah, no, not, like, nothing's yeah. free in life. I mean, yeah. I think I've uh, like yeah, I, I, yeah. There's a 
It's, a, it's a bad joke. Uh, a friend of mine said this, uh, like, uh, free sex is the most expensive sex. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good a, one. <laughs> and he had a point. Yeah. Very true. Well, that was really great. That was a, a good operational overview of the flash crash and not just a haywire term like it floats around otherwise. So that's good. Thank you, Ali. Thanks, Mike. Glad you liked it. Cheers. Cheers.